Hi there, guys. Warwick here from uh, from the Zoom talk tonight. Uh, bees and homesteading together. And uh, just a quick word of apologies from Tanya. She's without internet tonight, so it's just uh, me flying solo. But yeah, uh, we, we're still going to have a cool uh, chat, uh, awesome discussion about pollination and the secret that it beholds and uh, the wonder of it for the increase in your yield for your crops and your vegetables uh, so that you can have more sustainable food on your dinner plate. So welcome tonight and uh, thanks for joining us guys. Yeah, Andrew, nice to have you on. John again, Monet, uh, don't recognize your name so much, but uh, and I'm not sure who the Galaxy Tab is, but yeah, you guys are welcome. And uh, just some house rules. Uh, I'm going to go through a bit of a chat, uh, more of an open discussion. If you guys have a question, just raise your hand, let me know, and or, and, or post it in the chat to put down below. And then uh, I'll uh, I'll see um, when I get a chance, I'll, I'll have a look at that and then answer it for you guys. But generally, yeah, speaking, um, we're talking pollination tonight. So uh, the secret of that really is, uh, I think, yeah, I think everybody's able to, everybody's on, right? I think Galaxy Tab is having a bit of a problem with the audio. But um, anyway, uh, the show must go on. Um, so pollination, guys, pretty much um, I've been in this, I've been in beekeeping in, in beekeeping for since 2004 and uh, been in pollination. I was in pollination about three years full time. Uh, out in Nelspreit, and then I did some consulting down in the Eastern Cape as well for a big blueberry farm down there uh, that was uh, basically funded by the Social Welfare Development Corporation or Small Development Co Corporation, sorry. And um, yeah, it's been fantastic. And the knowledge and the experience that I've gained on from that part of the of beekeeping business has been phenomenal. And I just wish more people were able to uh, participate in, in pollination, that they'd understand how this all works and what the benefits are for us, even on a homestead or a small holding all the way through to commercial farms. Um, and to give you guys a quick, uh, a quick indication of this, I mean, I was doing conversations and, and presentations actually like this to the macadamia uh, farmers uh, back in 2010, 2011. So 10 years ago, and I've just now, uh, you know, obviously um, Sabio and uh, the Beacon people have um, partnered with the Macadamian Growers Association only now, 10 years later, give or take, uh, where they've, you know, they're really punting, they're realizing, they've recognized now, uh, even though I was saying it 10 years ago and many before me were saying it years before that as well, uh, that, um, you know, macadamians can have uh, quite an impact. It, it's not a lot per se in comparison to other things, but um, it's studies have been shown around the world, especially Australia, even in South Africa, most recently by Dr. Hanili Human at uh, Tuckies or the University of Pretoria, who I, I know well. Uh, we've worked together on a couple of previous uh, projects and things, but we've supplied them with the equipment that they need. And um, yeah, uh, it's, you know, on average between 12 and up to 18% increase in yield, depending on how the management of the macadamia orchard is, is done and what varietals there are that they plant. And also the strategy around how to, how to place the bees and when to place the bees and the spraying and all those sort of things that go with pollination, at least on a commercial level. But I think it indicates the, uh, even from a, even from, such a small amount, you know, what 12% is the minimum amount that's been uh, does, uh, studied or found in, through studies, that 12% on the baseline of when you have an orchard of say uh, 40 acres or 40 hectares rather, is a massive amount. You know, we're talking, we're talking the difference between um, a, f a farmer being able to, uh, you know, go away on holiday twice a year, you know, kind of thing, and take all of his family and probably give his soft bonuses, that kind of stuff. If they, if he's that way, or if they're that way inclined, he, she. Um, so it's it's a, it's a significant amount. And uh, when there's such a high competition to be sustainable, to be more organic, more clean, and all this sort of thing, uh, I feel that there's there's a big push around fertilizers. We've had some fertilizer fertilizer uh, guest speakers on the on on the Zoom with us here. And uh, there's lots of talk about pesticides and what you should and shouldn't be using and all that sort of stuff. And there's also, you know, what kind of GMOs are you using and or heirloom seeds and things like that. But very few people are talking, aside from maybe 
perhaps myself and other people in the industry have been trying very hard to educate farmers uh, and all the way down to the, the, the smallholders, you know, to, to basically, I think smallholders are easier to talk to uh, and easier to educate on this because a lot of them are really, a lot of you guys already have this knowledge and uh, are aware of it, which is awesome. And it's one of the ways that grassroots kind of working their way up, which is fantastic. But uh, to have a serious impact on food security, which is one of our mottos uh, or our missions rather, is, uh, is to have a top down as well. You know, so you start getting this top down effect where you've got 11,000 macadamian growers actually utilizing bees in their business, you know, in the business model. And can you imagine if 11,000 macadamian growers, and that's just one, one particular type of, of food, uh, one instance of food, uh, the macadamia nuts, if 11,000 of those growers just got one hive each, you know, it's not going to do that much to their orchard, obviously. But imagine if that was the case, if each one of those growers got one hive, it's 11,000 new colonies, new hives managed in South Africa, for example. It'd be phenomenal. Anyway, so let's get back to generic sort of uh, pollination, the secrets around that, what, uh, what the boosting effect of that could be, what are the best type of plants that you could be planting and or that have a benefit from bees and other pollinators, because not just all about bees. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we don't have bumblebees in South Africa. But there is also a commercial case for use of bumblebees in Europe, and uh, and I believe now more also uh, in in the states because they are able to um, either import bumblebees, the spe specific strain of bumblebees, and or have their own type of bumblebees there. What we have is commonly uh, misunderstood as bumblebees are actually either solitary bees or um, carpenter bees and that kind of thing. So wood borers, those, those are the sort of bumblebees that we generally in South Africa refer to as bumblebees, but they're not bumblebees. So they also do some, uh, so, so other bees besides honeybees also do pollinating. So do some flies, so do some birds, so do ants, so do uh, butterflies and moths and that kind of thing, so do bats. So there's a lot of other pollinators that are out there, but uh, tonight's one is in particular one that can be more managed, which is in this case, honeybees. Um, and the commercial case in Europe that I'm aware of is that there are a family of bumblebees, a specific species, I can't remember what they are, but there's a specific species in, in, in Europe that can be, is based on the same kind of family casting as, as a honeybee cast. In other words, you've got a queen, she can lay eggs, they have, she has work, you know, they have workers in the colony. Um, welcome, Santi. Uh, we've only just still, still sort of in the introduction just about, about commercial side of uh, pollination here. So you haven't missed much. Uh, thanks for joining. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they last about a season. So they are ideal in a way for, for a, from a commercial perspective. But you can't import them in South Africa simply because of our, um, our, our uh, what do you call it, like our... Um, biological security and that sort of thing. So unfortunately, that's not not availability and not an availability or an option for us. And hence this reason of pushing the bee, beekeeping and bees for pollination. So um, if we're looking at crops and things like that, uh, if you guys want to just check in the chat there, if you want to add into the chat what you might be growing, I can then answer and see uh, if I can advise and give you guys some insights as to whether the bees will actually help you with those or if they if they're not necessarily directly they may have an indirect impact, but not necessarily a direct impact. Um, but something that I think is absolutely an opportunity, and I've recently consulted with somebody in, in Joburg about this, um, as well as my previous, he wants to start a business in pollination, uh, pollination as a business service. Um, my previous history is actually doing consulting in the project and hands-on. I was out there in 2017 down in the Eastern Cape with these blueberry guys. And that was a period of about 18 months where we switched from what they were doing, we had to switch their pesticides because they were using pesticides, we had to switch their fertilizer. And the beauty about that is that they were they weren't growing in, they were growing in tunnels, but not closed tunnels. It was net sh shade netting. And these guys produced a lot. They were the second biggest blueberry farm in the country at the time and uh, exported pretty much 80% of their stuff. And they were bringing millions of millions of rands of, of business. And the difference for our bees being involved in that, or the bees, they weren't actually my bees, but the bees being involved in that uh, 
gave them gave them not only more berries but larger berries and so they were not only able to benefit from an, an, an additional weight or net weight and size, but a net, uh, a better fruit set, or in this case, berry set uh, of the berries on the same plants that they had last year, right? Or the year before. Um, so their production went up and they had a better grade of blueberry. So the profit margin was like incrementally or exponentially, I should say, uh, huge, the difference. So when they, when they did the numbers uh, over the, the second, in the, especially in the second season, because it takes about two seasons for, for the farmers to kind of start seeing the difference and not putting it down to, oh, it could be, it could have been the fertilizer we changed, or it could have been that we you know, did something different, or it could have been the weather, or it could have been this, could have been the, could have been the water, could have been the, the, who knows, you know, what, you know, maybe they started doing yoga or something like that. Who knows what it could have been? They, anything but the bees made, the, made this difference, you know? And um, <laughs> and uh, so so anyway, uh, consulting with this guy recently. I mean, he was you know sort of saying, um, what's the market like? What are the benefits like? And one of the best things that you guys could could utilize bees for on your small holding or even as a potentially as a commercial setup is that uh, things like. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sunflowers benefit tremendously. Uh, so if you're growing sunflowers and you go, let them go to seed and you want them to have really great seed, then bees are really fantastic. The only thing is obviously you only get a three to four week um, flowering period now with GMOs. I'm hoping most of you, or all of you will not, not use GMOs, but if you are using GMOs, those are the mainstream seeds that are available. Then the old flowering time period for pre-GMOs used to be six weeks. On sunflowers interestingly enough and that's been cut down to three weeks so uh, and some of them don't even offer pollen in that anymore which is also uh, or nectar anymore so some of them have been hybridized and and some of them are genetically modified where they're actually uh, a, quite a poor source now for bees um, in terms of the pollen and nectar they may still benefit in terms of actual pollination but they don't the bees themselves don't actually get any benefit from it so anyway, sunflower, heirloom, heirloom sunflower would be awesome. Um, avocados uh, are the biggest to date out of all the research that I've done. Anybody got avocados? You know, a couple of trees in the garden or maybe the neighbor's got an orchard or you've got an orchard if you're fortunate enough to, to, to have one. Um, if, if you have avocados, anybody who knows me and been through my emails and things like that, you'll know what the percentage increase is. So... If you know, then don't say anything, but anybody else who's new to the sessions and new to beware and new to, to me and beekeeping, who wants to have a go at what kind of percentage we're talking about difference between the, colony, the uh, avocado trees that had bees on them versus the avocado trees that didn't have bees and or other pollinators on them. Anybody want to have a go percentage wise increase? Macadamians we were talking about proven between 12 and about 18%. Um, what about avos? Anybody want to have a go? You can put it in the chat if you like. Uh, nobody, no takers. Yeah, silence, crickets. Eh? All right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> the research shows that basically an average mature avocado tree it takes what five, six years to start flowering and then giving fruit. Um, at least those are the non-GMO type based or spliced ones. And um, you were looking at about a 50 kilogram production on that. Uh, so if you had a tree at home and you were growing that, you're looking at about 50 kilograms of, of avos after about five years. Woohoo, awesome. I love avos. I'm, I think most people like avos. And uh, who, doesn't, uh, who doesn't like the uh, tortillas and everything else that you can do with it, okay? Smoothies, the whole thing. But um, if you include just a beehive in that area, Obviously, it depends on how big an area you've got uh, avocado it's growing on, for example. But if you include a couple of beehives in your, in this space within, say, a 500-meter space of wherever your ever trees are, amongst other things for that matter, you're going to end up having a 300%, up to 300% increase on, that, on every tree. Okay? So your average 50-kilogram production of a weight of about 250 to 260-gram fruit ever fruit uh, 
becomes 150 kilograms or up to about 150 kilograms on a single tree. So 300%. And uh, the, only, the only caveat or the only uh, sort of uh, drawback is that you're gonna end up with uh, a, a loss of overall net weight on the fruit. So where on average it was about 240, 250 grams, give or take, at 50 kilograms per tree. Uh, now you're looking at about 212, 210 grams per fruit, which is not necessarily, it's, it's quite a big percentage overall, but when you add up that you're getting three times the amount in actual net weight in kilograms per tree, it's phenomenal in different difference, right? So it's a, it's a massive difference. And this translates to all sorts of other trees and plants and crops and veggies that you're gonna be growing in your homestead. There are some that don't benefit at all from bees uh, or honeybees at least. Um, and they would need to have something like a bumblebee, obviously not in South Africa, because bumblebees don't exist in South Africa, but other kinds of pollinators, you know, moths, um, flies, et cetera. In fact, the same thing with avocados, there's only, there's about a 75% bee contribution for avocados. So in other words, what does that mean? That means that honeybees themselves or, or bees contribute 75% of the pollination to that particular fr fruit, okay? So the, so the other 25% is made up by other pollinators, which are like little flies, and butterflies, and things like that. And the same thing happens with the with majority of other, with other types of um, fruit crops, anything food, food related, tree related that flowers and then has some kind of um, fruit or seed that pops out after that. But citrus is another good example of you guys growing lemons. Lemons grow all around, all, all year round, right? They, they, they flower all year round, typically. So they're one of the absolute best sustainable fruit trees that you can grow on your homestead for that, for that fact, because of that fact, okay? And the same reason that it does that is a good reason for you to also have a hive in the area because it's a mutually symbiotic kind of thing where the bees are gonna have at least some food all the way through the year from your lemon trees. And you're gonna have some food all the way through you know, lots of nice tequilas and lots of uh, shots and lots of uh, lemon tarts and whatever else that you like, gin and tonics that you like having and whatever else you might like your lemons with, okay? Um, um, I like making mead with my lemons and I like eating them actually just raw. It's quite, it's quite a, it's really acidic, but it's really good to have in a nice tea in the morning, first thing. And it's beautiful to, to, to have that available just outside your garden or your back door, or whatever the case is. And this is the bonus is that if you've got a colony of bees on your property or near to your property, then um, not only can you have the honey on sort of on tap, but you also have now the, the, sorry, the lemons on tap, but now you also have honey that you can put in with your tea as well and uh, top it up that way. Uh, it's how immune boosting and healthy and all that sort of thing. And of course you can then take the peels and you can use, you know, scrape the peels, use that in your cooking and things like that, and then toss it and put it, make it into, put it into the fertilizer um, session and, uh, and rejuvenate the soil and so on and so forth. And so the cycle continues. So anybody uh, asked early on, anybody's got anything specific growing that we could maybe comment on? I've talked about lemons, talked about citrus, avos, macadamians, probably not, most people don't really have macadamians growing in their backyard, I would imagine, but, um, and probably not blueberries either, but uh, things like um, onions, if you want your onions to go to actual seed, uh, honeybees contribute about 80% of the, of the pollination of, of onion flowers that will then go to seed. So exceptionally good, except the honey is not that great. Obviously it tastes like, tastes and smells like feet actually. <laughs> the best, best description I can give you, but it tastes like onions. If you can think about raw, raw onions, that's what the honey tastes like. So it's not that great, but you may be able to cook with it. And that may, that may be a good uh, opportunity to, um, to utilize it as cooking honey. Uh, but the seed production is phenomenal, okay? Uh, on onions when using bees, for example. So what else benefits? So if we homesteading and we self-sustainable, we're most likely growing things like borage. It's phenomenal for bees, that's herbal. Okay, that's a herb, borage, sweet African basil, or African sweet blue basil. Phenomenal. If you can get that, it it's kind of flowers for a long period of time and it's hardy as well. So and it's beautiful, it's lovely to eat. Okay, as a as a um uh as a 
uh, as a herb. Uh, so oregano is a good one as well. Oregano. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the other name for it is because some people call it oregano and some people call it something else. But oregano is this good little blue or purple flower. Really, really not really good for the bees. Um, what else? Uh, in terms of lavender, obviously, is fantastic. Again, edible. You want the edible lavender. You don't have to have the level, uh, edible lavender for the bees, but for you, if you want to eat it as well, then you'd need the edible lavender. But lavender fine is actually the one that's best for the bees because uh, it grows that you get about six months worth of uh, flowering out of that, which is which is pretty pretty beneficial. Um, all right, we've got a... Ah, uh, oh, Santi, yeah, welcome. My question, my question, she's got a question. So is that bees, can bees coexist with chickens, especially free ranging? Hmm, they're not going to pollinate their chickens though, hey? <laughs> but uh, yeah, look, um, I would not keep, so uh, uh, the rule of thumb for me is I would not place bees within at least 50 meters of livestock that are locked up, um, especially horses and cage things chickens and that even dogs you know if they're locked up we're well, not locked up but if they uh bury it in you know if they if they're in a enclosed area they can't get away if the bees happen to react and become defensive for some reason they will sting anything within within the area uh, within 100 meters minimum uh of of them swarming and going on a defensive sort of attack uh so Yes, they can coexist with chickens, um, especially if they're free ranging and then not in a cage, they can then at least get away if anything does go awry. But um, one must just note, that's a good question because I have had a couple of, you know, I've heard of stories where people are, have got pigeons even, racing pigeons, breeding pigeons, they've got chickens, they've got breeding birds, uh, and they've also had bees. And it takes the one time when the bees get um, really defensive for some odd reason. They haven't been managed properly. They haven't been, um, or somebody opens the hive during the day and the bees react defensively as they would naturally. It's not their fault. And, uh, and then they, they do sting everything and they'll sting those birds. They'll sting the birds to death because you know, they can't get away. And the bees don't know that, that, that wasn't the, you know, they don't know that wasn't the bird's fault. They just know that there's something there. They can smell them, it's an animal, it's a threat, and they sting them. Okay, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so uh, you guys aren't coming back to me with questions about veggies and flowers that you've got. So um, let's talk about what it costs to set something up like this. So if you're looking at an A beehive on a homestead, one to two beehives in a homestead, you're looking at about two to two and a half thousand rand, depending on uh, where you're sourcing them from. And also if there's bees in there, for example, and also you're gonna need the other equipment. So you're gonna need a bee suit or a jacket, at least as a budget setup. And then you could wear an overall underneath that. <clears throat> you're gonna to need to have a smoker. The smoker uh, calms the bees down um, by uh, giving them the impression that there's a felt fire or a bush, fire, bush fire. And by doing that, their natural reaction is that they gorge themselves on honey. And when they do that, like just when we having a, like a braai or barbecue or a really big meal, our, our guts expand and we get all like lazy and lekker and machis, you know, machis full, your stomach's full, your eyes go heavy, okay? Machis too. Uh, same thing, similar thing happens with the bees, except that in a sense, what's happening is that they, uh, because the, their guts now expanded, they struggle, for, they struggle to uh, have the sting um, muscles uh, get restrained. They kind of get restrained so they do struggle to and they get heavier and they fly less and all that sort of stuff so they do get subdued or more docile let's say by using a smoker um that's going to be about 360 365 rand and and then you need a half tool and ideally you should get a blue book or a, a beekeeping book of some kind to get some knowledge or come in a course watch a bunch of youtube videos like mine and um and then get your hands dirty in, in beekeeping and uh, literally sticky as well in the honey and so on and so forth. Uh, the beauty about this is if you've got kids, um, you know, even, even from the age of about eight, nine, you can actually start getting them involved. They may not, you may not need or want them to be at the hive with you and have that a bit of an, a defensive aggressive experience if the bees go a little bit haywire. 
but you could also have them standing a little bit further away from the hive, having a look at it from an external perspective without interrupting or engaging the hive themselves and just watching the bees. Pretty therapeutic and it's pretty meditative. It also teaches kids about the sustainability of life, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the bee movie and all those, a lot of stuff in the bee movie is actually a little bit misnomer, mis, <laughs> misnomerized. It's not, uh, it's not technically correct, a lot of the stuff in there, but it does sweeten the deal for kids, you know, to watch a full movie and learn about bees per se and their roles that they play in our environment, especially with, with regards to food security. So uh, what other things benefit? So you've got soya, soya benefits. Um, you've got um, strawberries, pumpkins, watermelons, all benefit. Okay, you're going to get more pumpkin per, per plant. You're going to get bigger and better uh, watermelons per plant. Uh, most of the beans actually benefit. Um, so your snap pea, your peas and things like that will benefit. What else are you guys growing besides chickens at free ranging? Anybody? Nope. All right, guys. All right. So let me open the floor to some questions now quickly. If you guys have any questions about other beekeeping pollination, anything like that, go for it, Andrew. You can bring up your video and stuff and have a chat if you like. Hi, hi, Ward. How's um, it, man? Uh, so I've just started with beekeeping. Um, I've just done my first harvest. Um, and I got the hell stung out of me. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, were you was, were you wearing PPE? Yes, I was, but uh, they still they they really got me rather badly. But um, I'm okay. How oh, good. Uh, but I was just wondering. I did your your beginners course and I did your intermediate course. Oh yeah. And okay. I, good. I was just wondering whether there's any chance that you guys can do a course on harvesting the honey because um you know it's it's not quite as, as simple as what the videos show and that you sort of take it off and brush brush off the bees mm. the bees that i had they they weren't buggering off at all they they just uh they stuck on that um <laughs> on, the, on <laughs> that uh um, okay um, all right um, but um but uh, okay, so when did you do it though, Andrew? Was it during the evening or during the I, day? I, I did it. Uh, I did it early morning. I, I mm -hmm. sort of got up at five o'clock in the morning, and I was out there at uh, uh, just as as the as it became light. Um, okay. but these guys weren't happy. Yeah, look, okay, I'd, I'd, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we cover this on the course too, but uh, the it would be best to try and do it in the evening, the other way around at dusk. Is it? Uh, okay. Yeah, man, because it's nice for you to wake up in the morning and want to do this, but the bees are, they buzz, you know, literally, excuse the pun, but they are buzzing as soon as, uh, you know, the sun rises, even before the sun rises, actually. Right. Uh, they will be, especially during the summer, uh, the warmer months, they'll be out in the fields foraging. And the problem is, is if you do that, if you do it really early, if you do it any time in the day, the bees are only going to settle. They've got all the daylight to be upset and angry, okay, yeah, until, yeah. until dusk. So the idea is, is as a beginner, anyways, um, to 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 minimize that defensiveness factor right. and do it in the evenings. So you could even do it after dark, even. And then all okay. you do is you get one of those lights, you know, those red LED lights that we, yeah, we talk yeah. about on the course. Get mm -hmm. yourself one of those and do it after after dusk, even. So I would start, if you like, you can start smoking them, getting your kit ready, all of that at dusk. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just as a quick uh, rundown, you'd, you know, smoke, get a good smoke mm -hmm. going. And then you'd want to, you do, you do want to time it, you know, you want to time because it sounds like maybe a, 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 I wouldn't have done it when you did it in the morning. I would have done it dusk time. So that's, that would be tip number one. Tip number two is make sure that you're smoking properly because there's a bit of a technique on that. That's why we give that on the course. So yeah. essentially what you want to do is get good smoke. And then when you have the good smoke ready, you want to, you want to give three to four good puffs at the entrance of the hive. Okay. And then you've got to wait. Remember? Yeah. yeah must, no. just make sure you wait for two minutes, but not more than four minutes. And then yeah. you two more puffs again at the, at the front. 
and you'll hear that you'll literally go you'll hear the 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 sound in the in the box will rise it'll elevate it'll go it'll be like a low hum and then that second puff that you give in after two minutes it'll just notch up like two um two octaves it'll be like mm, and it'll go mm, okay it'll sound like that because now the bees are like oh there is a bush bushfire here okay there's a felt fire happening that's making sure everybody knows in the hive and they let, that's like the alarm of letting making sure that everybody knows in the hive this is not a false alarm okay yeah. and then what you want to do is pretty soon after that you want to open the lid and then not down into the hive just across the frames at the top where you open it you want to puff puff like that mm -hmm. okay so the smoke goes it goes you know like uh, what's the word horizontally over the frames not perpendicularly down into the into the space okay. just over the top and then what that does is that drives the bees down and away from the smoke and then technically you should be able to start getting the super if you're going to take the frames off while the bees are still there that's more that's also going to that's also going to uh, agitate them more so technically what we would normally do is take the bees off at the the super get the bees down with the smoke as i say wait for them to move away and then get the super off shake the thing smoke them there and then at the front of the hive not the not the brood box but the, the super if there any bees left mm -hmm. smoke the Smoke them down through this through the through the frames at that point near the front of the hive, and they will all fall out or fly out and fly away. Okay, and then you need to take your super and you take the super away. That's the best way of doing it. Okay, right. and then you can deal with the you know there probably will still be stragglers and things like that. You could brush those off if you wanted to, um, but if you're putting them on the back of the bucky or the back of your your uh, utility vehicle, or whatever, then mm -hmm. um, then you can take that where you where you need to harvest it from there and then bring it back but don't don't let that time frame go past so 48 hours you want to do that within 48 hours okay because if the bees are that strong and they're that built up if you take longer than 48 hours to do that they're going to start look, working thinking okay there's not enough space here and then they're going to start switching over to being absconding okay okay all right so ideally you should have a spare super and you put that on straight away you right. take the full super away with you, then it doesn't matter. You can do with it what you like for as long as you like, yeah. and then you can take it back. But at least you've maintained the space, you see, in the yeah. hive. Okay, so great question there. But right. yes, uh, hopefully you had antihistamines and things like that. And uh, it's quite an odd feeling, hey, getting stung, especially if you get stung a number of times. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, it's, 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 it's not very pleasant, obviously, with the pain in the beginning. And then, I've, and then you phase over, right, into like a bit of a, uh, ooh, this is relaxing. It's kind of like the body almost like goes into a relaxing kind of phase. And then it goes, and then I find that I go in the next morning, especially the day after, I have this very cool, like happy feeling. It's like a euphoric almost feeling, right? I don't know if you experience the same thing. Uh, not quite. Uh, no? quite, a bit of, quite a bit of swelling and quite a bit of pain. But, well, that uh, too. I mean, that does come, but yeah, it's... Uh, uh, did you yeah. put bicarbonate on no no i didn't put, I didn't put anything on i just left it to sort of sort itself out and it did yeah. but uh, there's no no major side effect thank you, yeah, Thanks you just, for just make sure you take rings off and things like that when you do your beekeeping because if you do get stung on the fingers or the hands and they swell up with a ring there you can lose a finger you know that kind of it's drastic but it can happen okay yeah Okay. Nice one. All right. Hopefully that's answered your question. But uh, yeah, I'll look into that. I mean, I'm not sure how many people would be interested in that, but it could be a thing. You know, I'll have a look at that for the new year, Andrew. Right. How, how to do like a practical day where we can do some harvest because we do have some harvesting that needs to be done there at, my, at the venue. Yes. So yeah. That's cool. Right. Thanks, man. Okay. Thanks. Bye. All right. Ciao. All right. Santi, you growing pumpkin. Phenomenal. When are you getting a beehive? <laughs> And uh, if you want to have info on the courses, okay, so if you want to have info on courses, uh, there's our website there. Um, I think that's the forward slash training. Or just be read at ZA forward slash, uh, uh, not forward slash, and then just click on training. But um, pumpkins, phenomenal, do, do really well. Okay, um, I'm just trying to think of a few others. Um, we spoke about lavender, 
tomatoes don't necessarily do that well. Uh, garlic again would be good for seeds. Uh, obviously, the garlic grows on the ground, but the seeds production is good for good uh, good for the bees and good for the garlic itself. Um, and then you've got things like uh, there's there's a bunch of other herbs that you can that you can also um, and and fruits and things like that. So raspberries are good. Strawberries are good. Uh, we've mentioned blueberries, black currants, uh, blackberries, mulberries. All of the berries. A lot of the berries actually benefit from bees if you're growing any of those on your on your properties. And uh, and then things like pears. Um, apples are phenomenal. Okay, apples are also an exceptionally good bee bee crop uh, for pollination. They benefit massively from that. You can get obviously more apples and a bigger apple, better fruit set, bigger apple uh, when you're using bees on those. Citrus, the same thing, um, and then you also get a beautiful citrus honey or what we call orange blossom, and that also sells. That can also sell and or tastes amazingly, but it also sells at a premium simply because it is just a much much sought after honey because it's delicious. You know, it really tastes phenomenal. Lychees or lychees, depending on where you're from and how you pronounce the, 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 the fruit's name. But if you're in the Zanin Valley or anything like that, or if you're in KwaZulu Natal growing lychees, or you have lychees on your property, if you think lychees are nice, wait until you taste lychee honey. That's even better. Um, and putting them together with some ice cream, mwah, Absolutely, Bella, Bella, what do you call it? Uh, Monte Bella, okay, beautiful. Uh, Santi has a question. During winter, I think food can be scarce to these, yes. Responsibly, which plants are best during the winter season, especially herbs? Yeah, so there's not that many that'll flower over that winter period, but um, something like aloe daviana, which is not a herb, but aloe daviana in the half of area is phenomenal. Uh, a lot of the in, the, in the Western Cape and that sort of thing, you have the um, um, Feinbos and Bushu or Buhu. That also makes an excellent food for bees, but and bus, that's a mutually, mutually beneficial relationship there. Um, and Buhu tea is actually really good for you too. So you can have the honey and you can have the tea and leaves and whatever and drink the whole thing. Wonderful. Um, time's a good one. Uh, can be sometimes obviously difficult to grow and obviously, obviously for winter it's probably not one that's going to work but time is a time's a really good hive uh sorry uh, herb for for bees um what else um yeah any of the basils the sweet basil but the african blue basil is the best one in south africa if you can get that and you can get that i think through through um tanya's group there's a couple of people that are selling that selling seeds anyway for it uh, for most of the stuff i've mentioned tonight actually so yeah you can go through any one of those and uh and plant the plant those plants and or include bees in your in your pollination what you could do as well is that you could find out if there's in the group or amongst your circle of friends your network if there's somebody that's already keeping bees somebody like andrew paps who sounds like he's He's got enough food in his area, but there may be times when he has a dearth period, like Santi was talking about. And but you've got things flowering in your garden. Uh, so what could happen is that by arrangement, and obviously with the knowledge that there is some liability or responsibility for the bees and or safety and health and safety type of stuff, um, place the bees in a responsible area on the property of a friend's and inform obviously the neighbors and anybody else that comes onto the property on a regular basis. And then the, your flowers would benefit from the bees being there and the bees would benefit from being there with your flowers and everybody wins. So there's lots of scope available here where you can create a little network in your community and somebody who's got lack of flowers growing and like an orchard or um, herbs or uh, crops that are growing, they don't have bees and you've got bees and maybe you don't have the crops or the flowers or the fruit or the veg growing. So you could go to them and say, hey, listen, for a couple of jars of honey and for really boosting the yield of all your food uh, that you're going to produce, how about I put a hive on your property? You know, And uh, generally speaking, as long as obviously, as I say, the liability issues are covered, you can then, um, you can then do a, a really cool barter, barter share type situation. So that's pretty awesome. Um, 
Uh, okay, Santi's asking about propolis. Uh, and how is it harvested? Okay, well, you can use propolis sheets. Uh, propolis sheets go under the lid. It's a plastic tray. Uh, you can get those at the shop. And uh, what will end up happening is that it creates a bit of space between the lid and the, and the hive, and the bees don't like that kind of space. What they do is they'll fill that space. And by doing so, they've, they basically propolize the space in the sheet. And then what you do is you can harvest that. It, that's a very commercial way of doing it. It's not expensive. I think they're about 60 Rand for a sheet or something like that. Uh, well worth it, to be honest. You don't get a hell of a lot of production of propolis though. And it really is dependent. It's, it's you know, hives have their own personalities and characters. Like this one Andrew was talking about sounded quite defensive, more defensive perhaps than, than they could have been or should have been depending, but uh, they do sound that they sound like they're pretty defensive. Uh, more so than maybe the average defensive colony. So maybe on, on the DEF CON levels, you know, he's as DEF CON 4, uh, which is higher than the average, which I'd say is about DEF CON 2. Um, but it also depends on what the beekeeper's done as well and time of day and things like we've discussed. Um, but uh, the same thing goes with honey production. The same thing goes with pollen production. So I... So I've technically out of the out of the number of colonies that I've managed and 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 had in, in my career as a beekeeper, there will be specific uh, colonies that I know to be exceptionally careful. I only open them at, at night and I make sure my, my neighbors know I'm doing that and that they need to be just on alert the next day or two even. And they are far away from any animal dwellings or, or livestock dwellings, shelters, even human dwellings, that kind of stuff, because I know that they're DEF CON 5 type character colony okay a lot of people will say and i've said this too before to people that if you are inclined you can replace that kind of queen because it is the queen that's usually determining the, the determining this kind of um, defensiveness okay uh, so you could replace the queen if you know how to do that it isn't basic it isn't beginner stuff and you could lose the colony if you don't know what you're doing so it's not something you should come on a course or get a course, get some more knowledge before you do that kind of thing. But you can do this. You can replace the queen with a queen that's less, less defensive, let's put it that way, or less aggressive uh, or reactionary uh, when you're trying to harvest or work with your bees. But the same thing goes with some, with, with, with some queens and some colonies will be more, more uh, attuned to uh, propolizing. And therefore, you can um, generally, you if you're going to harvest propolis, you you do tend to sacrifice some honey production because it takes a lot of resources to make propolis. So what I tended to do is I would manage the colonies in such a way that when I found that there was one that was producing more propolis, for example, I wasn't that worried about because I had like almost a hundred hives. Um, you know, when I was full, full, fully into the beekeeping, from a from a commercial perspective, I was managing about a hundred, almost a hundred hives, uh, with, almost on my own. Basically, most of the time I was on my own, and um, I would then. So I wasn't worried about one or two or three or five of them being more populous producers than, say, uh, getting every one of them or five of my hives only doing honey, for example. And, and, and doing pollination and stuff like that. So if you've got five hives and all five of them aren't doing as, doing as well as, as you'd like them to do in honey production, you know, then it's a little bit more of a stress level difference to, to if you've got like 100 hives and five of them are doing that. But um, the likelihood of all five hives, for example, if you're keeping five hives, the likelihood of all 100% of them doing propolis is, is small, very small. But yeah, that's how you harvest propolis. If you want to do it in a in a proper way where it's going to be as clean as possible a couple of risks around propolis is that if you scrape it off the frames and if you scrape it off the underside of the lids for example that sort of thing you can introduce things like wood piece pieces of wood that come off with it other other impurities that could go in the propolis and then it's harder to harder to clean and it's harder to uh, extract the propolis away from those impurities and or potentially harmful uh, chemicals Okay, because uh, that would end up in the in the propolis. Yeah, no, no problem. I know about the load shedding. It's nasty stuff at the moment, and a lot of guys actually are out of water even, so it's a bit scary at the moment in some places. But it's great that you at least have internet. That's cool. 
Um, yeah, so back to the pollination, guys. Any, any questions at this stage about the pollination? Uh, how would the pollination work? Okay, so bees, quickly, just to explain. So we talked a little bit about the cost earlier on um, and how you would benefit in terms of the growth. Obviously, plant to plant to plant, there's a, diff there's a ratio of how effective or not effective, bees are effective in pollinating. It's a bit how much does the plant itself or that particular strain species of plant uh, benefit. That ranges, it's not about the bees doing that or having a fault in that. It's actually more about uh, just the influence on that flower, okay? Um, and the benefit that that flower will have in an increase. Um, and then obviously your taste, the honey will be different depending on which flowers they're foraging from and stuff like that. But remember, um, uh, if they're seeing more than, if you've got a hive or two on your property, then they're not just gonna go to the arrows or they're not just gonna go to the pumpkins. They're gonna go all over the place. So that honey then becomes what's called the multiflora honey. And it's not just a single, it's not just a single source honey. So if, you, if you've got like 20 hectares of sunflower, for example, and you put a hive in the middle of that, the likelihood, well, I wouldn't put it in the middle, by the way, I'd put it on the outside of that, of that site, uh, technically speaking. But uh, because they don't like, uh, they don't really forage within about a 50 meter radius of the hive. It's kind of like a no forage zone there, preferably. They go past 50 meters or so, and then they start foraging. Um, and then sometimes even above that, between 50 and 100 meters. So you can bear that in mind too. But uh, if you place them inside a, um, a 20 acre or 20 hectare ground and sunflowers and, and they're flowering and there's not much else flowering in the area, then the likelihood is that you're going to have sunflower, mostly sunflower derived honey. Then you can call it sunflower honey and it'll granulate within about three to four weeks as well. That doesn't mean it's going off. It, go it doesn't mean it's going bad or anything like that. All it means is that it has a natural, it's, it's, it's honey's natural way of preserving itself. Okay. Uh, something like avo honey won't, you will eat it before it granulates, for example. But if you let it sit there, it would sit there for at least a year, probably. I've never let my avo honey sit there for longer than a year. I've tried it before it has the chance to actually granulate, but it'll sit there for longer, for long, at least a year without granulating or going hard. Okay. Sunflower, not though. And, um, and there's a number of other, there's a number of other types of, so citrus is a good one as well. It doesn't granulate for a long time. Neither does lychee, um, but any one of those will be lovely honeys and exceptionally good for boosting your yield on your veggies and or crops and or fruits, fruit trees that you're using and growing stuff on. So yeah, um, if you guys don't have any questions, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Oh, so things to avoid, maybe risks, is that if you are using pesticides, ideally uh, the groups that, that you guys come from and the background that you guys come from, you're probably not using that many pesticides. I should hope that you're not using too many pesticides. Um, but obviously, if you are going to be spraying on plants and things like that and you have bees in the area, it's really good idea and actually, uh, you know, good practice that you move those bees away for a week to another property either of your own or another part of your property or friends or somebody else's property obviously where they aren't going to be spraying either <clears throat> leave them there for at least a week once you've finished your spraying if you if you are happen to be using pesticides or chemical pesticides and then bring them back after that um, because if you don't do that then generally speaking what can happen is um, your bees will get will forage on that on that flower and they will get pesticides on them and when they're pollinating they will then take that back to the hive not only can they die but then you're now contaminating your honey as well so that those chemicals will end up in your honey and then you you think you can go eat that honey and you do eat it and you are consuming those chemicals as well and or if you sell that honey on the same story for your customer which would not be advisable and uh, is immoral as well. So um, that's one of the things. Pesticides would be one of the big things uh, to, to, to avoid for those reasons, all of those reasons. And also in general, you should probably shouldn't be, I'm not, I'm not here to preach, but if you are wanting healthy and good quality and clean uh, food on your table, 
pesticides should be avoided, in my opinion. Um, yeah, cool. So I'm going to, I think, uh, I think we've covered pretty much a uh, majority of what I can cover in, in, a, in, in, this, in this sort of platform at the moment, other than, you know, if you guys want to come and be courses and things, I can learn how to do this in a commercial way, then we do have those, we do have, as Andrew was saying, we've got, you know, basic course with an intermediate course. And I'm, I am busy at the moment with a pollination course and uh, uh, setting up a pollination as, as a business service. But, um, you know, that that's going to be a number of hours and days worth of, of uh, training and stuff like that with a lot of background. You would need to have the other courses behind you in order to do the pollination course, simply because you need to know about bees in order to run a pollination uh, business. But um, it's a good business, it's a good opportunity, and it's something that you guys can, uh, that everybody can take a, take advantage of or, or see an opportunity in just keeping one or two halves at home. There are multiple you know, cultures around the world that happen to keep a little catch box or a small hive on their balcony even in some cases. Obviously, those bees are much more docile than ours, and they've been bred to be docile for that, for that uh, purpose. Um, but there are many people around the world that keep one to two hives on their small holdings just simply for all the benefits i've mentioned already but also in addition to that because bees are prolific pollinators on across the board um, what ends up happening guys is that your entire ecosystem is going to improve and be and the biodiversity is going to enhance so the grasses and things like that could, in, you know, improve. The, even the obviously the weeds and the wild growing stuff are going to improve. But that means that everything, the soil starts improving. You know, you, there's this massive circular type of effect that starts happening. Um, because if we're looking after the bees, we're not using pesticides. We're careful what fertilizer we use. We don't use glyphosates. We are concerning ourselves with you know what kind of seeds we're using are we planting gmos are we not planting gmos because the bees are there now you know all of these things start ending up you know even though it may be based on oh i'm thinking about the bees the overall effect is quite phenomenal and quite far-reaching as to uh the ultimate benefit that we could have and experience in ourselves on our small holdings in our communities and in the greater scheme of things so yeah guys thanks for tonight if there's any final questions feel free uh you know if you want to get involved with our in, in uh, but with beekeeping then um we do have a page you can subscribe to which will send you tons of kind of uh, free articles about beekeeping and get you get you a little bit more knowledge uh, about the scope of what's available what else you can do how beekeeping works etc cetera, etc cetera. oh there's a question yay Let's have a look at that. Uh, who's this? Okay. Ah, okay. Right, right. Okay, so just so that you guys know, so John's asking about a bee that's not a honeybee, okay, from the sounds of things. Um, there are over 20,000 subspecies of bees around the world. Not honeybees, sub, just bees. And that, that uh, if you guys are interested in looking at different kinds of bees, um, have a look at uh, orchid bees. They're absolutely stunning, just like the orchid flowers. These bees have, uh, there are subspecies of their own, as are many others, like carpenters and solitary bees and so on, and bumblebees, etc. But orchid bees are amongst the most beautiful and amazing looking insects on the planet, in my opinion. Um, you know, if you if you talk about things like metallic colors and and design and stuff like that, I mean the ergonomics, the 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 the, the uh, what do you call it, the um, how pleasing to the eye they are to even to look at, even though they're insects, it's just it's quite something. Orchid bees, have a look at them. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, you also get funny enough, you also get um, stingless bees. Obviously, carpenters and those sort of things don't sting anyway, but you do get stingless bees that make honey. There's a couple of those species around the world. And out of all the 20,000 subspecies of bees, guys, that do pollination all over the world, just like the butterflies, moths, 
birds, bats, etc. Well, we should be looking after all of them. And I think that's the beauty of honeybee, the, the, the save the bee type movement thing at the moment. And, and all these, everybody getting into beekeeping and homesteading and small holding and doing the no chemicals, no GMO type stuff and keep trying to keep things as real as possible, as organic or as original as possible, is that all the other things benefit, you know, it's like a ripple effect. Um, and um, out of these 20,000 bees, there's the stingless bees that make honey uh, and only about uh, 26 or 27, it's not more than 30 bees in the world, um, or honeybees, and they make honey. Some of them are stingless. Um, I think about three or four subspecies are stingless. And there are some that exist in Indonesia. And uh, I think there's a couple in Australia. There's the South Pacific area and then South America. And then, uh, yeah, so they're, they're amazing little creatures and we've got a lot to learn from them and a lot to benefit from them as well. So cool. Uh, that's in closing, uh, guys. If you want to watch any, any any of our previous videos, then you can. Uh, there should be a, should have been a link in the email that you joined uh, tonight or that you came through tonight um, on our Zoom replays, and then also on our YouTube channel. There's uh, there's usually some replays uh, like this video. Basically, will go up there probably in, by the weekend, by the end of the weekend, if you want to re rewatch it or share it, whatever the case is. So thanks for joining us tonight, guys. If there's any more questions, uh, feel free. John, I know you're talking about normal bee. It's lighter in color. It's always alone. Yeah, this probably sounds like a solitary bee of some kind. And um, they, you can actually buy little little solitary bee hives, uh, bee houses, really. And they all they do, all they are is like little bamboo shoots, little round bamboo shoots, like, like think of a um, straw. And, you know, maybe have like 15 or 20 of those. You can make them yourself, usually about that long. And then uh, the bees, all the solitary bees will kind of move into each little each little hole. <laughs> That's really quite cool. Um, so yeah, you can you could get one of those. And then uh, a lot of them are stingless, so they wouldn't even sting you even if they had the you know not that they have the inclination. But it's just quite nice to have something from nature that's uh, not likely to sting you. If you're not interested in doing honeybees, you could do this bee houses, solitary bee houses. And uh, um, carpenter bee, carpenter, carpenter houses, that kind of stuff. And these you can get a, you know, probably online, take a lot, or um, a lot of the nurseries actually have them, uh, and and plant shops and things like that will have these these little uh, bee houses. Uh, they won't how they won't house honeybees, but they will have they will provide homes for all the other little bees. Okay. Awesome, guys. So hopefully you've learned a lot and you've enjoyed your stay. I've enjoyed hosting for tonight. Again, apologies from Tonya. She couldn't make it. She had technical issues, wasn't in, in range of internet, but we won't have a chat next week. It's the final, it's the week, uh, what you call it, the uh, last Wednesday is the um, end of the month kind of week. So we skip that one, but we'll, we'll probably have a new one again uh, the following Wednesday. So uh, all the best, guys. And can't believe it's almost like it's almost like December. Amazing. Hopefully you guys got some cool plans for December. And uh, there is, by the way, there is still good time if you want to get into bees. As I was saying to this chap, I was, I've been uh, consulting for, you know, you don't have to have all the kits and everything right now to start with bees. What the best thing to do is to actually get a catch box or two. I'd, I'd recommend two catch boxes, which is a small small size box. Just bigger than a shoe box really uh, generally speaking and it, it'll have about four or five five to six frames in it actually wooden frames in there and uh and we're talking about langstroth langstroth based catch boxes here not uh, top bars but you could make a top bar hive a small version of a top bar hive very quickly and easily and quite cheaply and uh put it outside where there's flowering where there's flowering and where there's bees on those flowers Put a little bit of lemongrass in there. The likelihood is that you may, it's not guaranteed. Obviously, none of this stuff's in none of the, this kind of practice is guaranteed, but the, the likelihood is that you could end up having a colony, either a trekking colony that's moving past looking for a home to move in there, 
or you could have a colony in the area that within about a kilometer away or so that wants to propagate and they create a new queen and the queen it takes about uh, remember this does take about 25 days so there's a bit of length of period if there's a, not a trekking swarm moving in and there's a um, splitting swarm that comes in that's about 25 days before you'll have that take place so cool giving you guys some big tips here get some catch boxes get a copy of the beekeeping in south africa book if you're in the country otherwise get on our get on our subscription our email subscription you guys can pick up some some lots of tips there we've also got a practical e uh, practical beekeeping ebook if you're interested in that so just get in touch all right guys awesome final questions as, as the bells rolling bells bells going now and then we're going to call it a night anybody feel free to type it or you can come online um, okay andrew you're welcome man yeah just remember dude don't don't open your bees in the daytime okay for now especially that that colony sounds pretty um pretty defensive and you do it in the evenings use a red light and uh, make sure you're smoking them well okay and give them enough time two minutes to four minutes before you start opening it up good stuff okay guys i'm going to call it a night then thank you very much have a great one we'll see you in about two weeks time excellent there's no more questions Warwick out and happy beekeeping, happy pollinating, happy, happy homesteading. <laughs> Here's to being self-sufficient, guys. Take it easy. Ciao, ciao.